I encourage you to open your Bible this morning to our sermon text, which is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. You can find that in the Black ESV Pew Bible in front of you on page 4. If you don't have a Bible, you can take that Bible with you. Consider it our gift to you. We want everyone to have a Bible this morning. Genesis 4, verses 1 through 16. If you have that open and you're able, please stand with me as we hear God speaking directly to us from His Word this morning. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Please be seated. Let's pray again and ask the Lord to speak to us. Holy Spirit. Use this word to produce in us a holy reverence for the life-changing power of the gospel. For your kingdom's purposes, we ask this. Amen. I once worked for a construction firm, and when I worked for them, I was being shown how to nail siding to the side of this house. And my foreman was trying to explain to me that when you nail this siding onto this house... You can't drive the nails in all the way into the wood because the siding needs a room to flex when the weather hits it and the sun and all of that. And so I said, okay. And so I went away and just nailing away with my own definition of nail and my own definition of weather and sun and my own definition of hammer and wood. And what happened was he had to come behind me and replace all of it because the nails were too close to the wood. And the siding was being chipped, and I was actually destroying this whole process of everything that we were trying to build together. God has expectations for how we love Him, how we worship Him, how we approach Him, how we submit to Him. And when we define those expectations in our own way, really, really bad things happen. Everything that God's trying to build gets destroyed if we're not submitting to the Lord's definitions of how we are to approach Him. Cain wants to bring this offering to God that he thinks is fine. He doesn't even care what God thinks. And it's going to be destructive and ultimately unacceptable to God. If you're just new to our sermon series, we've been in Genesis. And what we've been doing is we've been walking through it, applying thus far all that it means for God to create the world and for God to establish His people and where they're going to dwell with Him and how they're going to interact with Him. And we've seen what it means for His people to submit to the creature rather than the Creator, submitting to the serpent rather than to God. And thus far, what's happened is that has meant banishment. So they're out of the Garden of Eden, 
And they're in a place where life is going to be really, really difficult. And here we are, right here, in the very first epic of what it looks like outside the garden. What does life look like away from the presence of the Lord? And what it looks like is conflict. And it's not just conflict between these two brothers, but it's conflict also with God. We see the promise of Genesis 3.15 being worked out. The conflict between the seed of the serpent, the conflict between the seed of the woman, in these two brothers, Cain and Abel. And what I want to do is simply walk through this passage and be applying the difference between what it means to be ruled by sin, that's Cain, versus what it means to be ruled by God. In our context, being ruled by God and God's word means that we're actually becoming people who are ruled by grace. People who are ruled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not what's happening in Cain's life. What this passage is doing, it's showing us the, the effects of disobedience. The effects of sin. That the Bible calls sin many things. It calls it treason. It calls it rebellion. It calls it disobedience to God's word. A hard-heartedness. A stiff-neckedness. A stubbornness. A lack of submission. That's Cain. And Moses, who's writing all this, is trying to explain to us a very clear point. And that is, do not be like Cain. Do not associate with God the way Cain does. Do not think about God's word the way Cain does. And so that's what we're going to do. We don't want to be ruled by sin. What are you ruled by in your life? We want to be ruled by God. So as we walk through this passage, we'll be applying how to do the opposite. Of what Cain is doing here in this epic story as he interacts with God on multiple levels. So, so ultimately the goal is to really be applying what it means to be ruled by God. So God's redemption dwells with us and we can stay in the presence of the Lord. You don't have to be like Cain and be driven away from it. So let's dig into the text and see what the Lord has to say. Verse 1. It says, now Adam and Eve, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived, and bore Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. So Eve is recognizing here that the Lord is fulfilling his promise, so that she, the Lord is going to help her bear a son, but as we'll see here in a moment, this son is not quite the savior that they were looking for, right? And so as we start digging in the passage, God is beginning to address the heart of what's wrong with Cain in verses 2 through 5. So it says this in verse 2. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So here's a million dollar question. Why did the Lord have no regard for Cain's offering? Now during this time, the Lord still had some kind of association with Adam and Eve. We don't know what that looked like. We know it looks different than what it looked like in the garden. And in this communication he had with these people, what was probably happening is they were probably bringing offerings to the Lord as tribute or in, in some sort of act of worship. We're not given a ton of details, but we know they're bringing some offerings out of respect and appreciation and honor for the Lord. It, you know, in Leviticus, this same word for sacrifices, the sacrifices that are offered by Cain and Abel, is the same word used in the context of celebration and thanksgiving. So something like that is going on. I don't think there's a full-blown understanding of atonement yet. All that's debated. But they're bringing these offerings. And what some scholars have said is that Cain's offering was rejected because it was a grain offering. And, and Abel's offering was accepted because it was an animal sacrifice. You know, honestly, I actually don't land there. I don't think that's exactly the reason why the Lord has rejected Cain's offering. It, it, it's clear that he was a worker of the ground, and he's bringing what he earns. Abel is a shepherd. He's bringing one of his flock. And there are grain offerings accepted in the temple. I mean, this is actually a part of that sacrificial system. we got to remember, too. Remember this. Moses, who's writing this, is probably writing this while Israel is in the wilderness because of their hard-heartedness towards God. They, they have not been obeying the Lord's word. Disobedience, it it's always comes from a lack of submission. 
lack of faith in what God has to say. And what he's trying to communicate is this. Cain presents his offering to God with a heart that is as hard as a rock, as stubborn as a mule, as proud as a peacock. Put in whatever animal illustration you want. That's his heart towards the Lord. Cain does not love God. Cain does not honor God. Cain's not trusting in God. He's not even listening to what God has to say. You can see here in a moment, we're going to be able to see this contrast between Cain's conversation with God and Eve's conversation with the serpent. There's meant to be a parallel here. Eve is listening to the serpent. Cain cannot listen to God. And he's actually telling him the truth. He's not being led astray like the devil was leading Eve astray. And if you really want to put icing on the cake, right? I mean, you, you really want to know the heart of what's going on inside of Cain. Look what he does to his brother. This man has no love in his heart if he's going to kill his brother. This is the opposite of love going on inside this man. And God's standard is for people to approach him with their offerings, isn't it? But he wants people to approach them with their offerings, with hearts that love God. Israel's in the wilderness. They can do all the rituals they want. They can play the part. They can follow all the rules. But if their hearts are far from God, they're not accepted. God wants people to love him. Not just submit to him out of duty, but to submit to him out of delight for him. If we don't love God and our hearts aren't submitting to his word, then how are we supposed to worship him rightly? Jesus, when he calls us into a relationship with God by faith in him, if you're trusting in Jesus, one of the elemental characteristics of your faith is that you have a love for God and a love for others. Cain doesn't have that. We are naturally the opposite. We're, we're, we're naturally ruled by sin. That's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus actually rules over sin for us. And we'll get to that here in a moment. But we see how God begins to, to open up the curtain to look inside Cain's heart and see what's really motivating him in verses 6 and 7. It says this, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So have you ever seen a kaleidoscope? You hold up to the light, and it's through the light you can see all the different colors and, and just all the different patterns that it's making with the colored glass. That's what God's doing with Cain for us. He's lifting him up. He's holding him up to the light of truth so he can peer into his heart and to see why. He's not accepted, and why he's angry with God. And the reason why God does not accept him is because his, his heart is being devoured by sin. It's like sin is this wild animal, and it's sitting there just, just ready to pounce on him and, and maul him to death. But what Cain's got to do, he's going to love God. Cain has got to rule over that. When you're a kid, you always fantasize about what it would look like to ride a tiger. Maybe that's just me. Right? Abram, am I right? That's right. But why is that so dangerous? It's dangerous because that tiger is a wild animal. No matter what he looks like behind the glass or behind the bars, don't let that animal fool you. Because it can't fool you. You don't want to dance with a bear. It may seem unassuming and cuddly and precious, but he's not Winnie the Pooh. That bear is going to destroy you. Same is true with our sin. Don't dance around with hurtful words. Over time, all those hurtful words means your reputation will be destroyed. People won't trust you. Your spouse won't trust you. Your kids won't trust you. If the hurtful words are crouching at your door, ready to devour them. Don't dance around with bitterness in your heart. You dance around with bitterness in your heart, then not only will you destroy how others think about you and how you think about others, you might destroy that relationship entirely. It'll be gone. All because you've been devoured by bitterness. Don't dance around with pornography. It will destroy your brain. 
It will destroy how you perceive others. Don't dance around with those flirtatious comments of co-workers. They will catch up. They will destroy you. Don't dance around with rebellion against authority. Teenagers, kids, don't dance around with rebelling against the authority of your parents and your teachers and your coaches that the Lord has put over you. If you do, then they won't trust you. They'll start losing respect for you. Whenever you need their recommendation for that job that you want, they won't give it to you. It'll be destroyed. Don't dance around with pride. Pride is a terror. Pride will destroy you. Pride, will, pride destroys our perceptions of ourselves so that whenever someone else tries to step into our lives and show us how we're being wise in our own eyes, we won't listen. We'll think they're crazy. We'll think we're the ones who are actually being humble because pride, it's squelched our conscience. Sin will destroy us. Our, our flesh and the devil, this is what they want. They want nothing more than for our hearts to be mauled to death by the destructive power of sin. And here's a little secret. None of us can rule over that wild animal on our own. We need God's help. And that's where the gospel steps into our lives. If there's anything that Cain needs right here, right now, is he needs the good news of Jesus to step in to show him how through faith, submission, this is what he can't do. Through a love for God and His Word, He can rule over sin. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you don't believe the gospel, this is why the church says so many things about the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has accomplished for us. Jesus actually has the power we need to destroy sin. Jesus can, can overcome our disobedience and overcome our rebellion and our lack of submission. He conquers over all our sinful habits. And the way he does it is by dying on the cross for us as a perfect sacrifice, a perfect offering for us. So when Jesus dies on the cross, all of our sins become him. So in other words, he doesn't just die as some any other man died. He actually becomes sin. So he takes on all of our lying. He takes on all of our pride. He becomes the most ungrateful person. He, he becomes sin for us, and he's crushed. And the reason why he's crushed is so that the sin dies with him. So if you think sin has power over your life, it doesn't if you're believing in Jesus. He's ruled over it. He's conquered it. It's dead. It's gone. We're called to simply, but yet profoundly, repent of that sin and trust in Him. The reason why we can't rule over sin is because for us it's impossible. You're, you're never going to go to Amazon.com or to Barnes & Noble and see ruling over sin for dummies. It's, just, it's, it's not going to be there. That's not what we're called to do. Because we can't. But Jesus does it for us. Are you submitting to him? If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, being a Christian doesn't mean trying to earn your way to God by being a better person or coming to church because you want to be inspired to be a better you or because it's just morally appropriate for our context and you want to save face with, face with people in the community. That's not what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian is realizing that God's standard for holiness is perfect. And we don't meet that standard. But Christ meets it for us. So if we're believing in what Jesus has done for us, we actually receive his righteousness. Isn't that amazing? So instead of being clothed with sin, it's like we're walking around with, with sinful rags all over our bodies. God takes those off and replaces them with Jesus' perfect tuxedo of righteousness for us. We haven't earned it. But yet Christ has graciously given it to us if we believe. Are you believing? Are you trusting? Are you changed by God's grace? It's a lie that everyone goes to heaven. That's a lie. Not everyone goes to heaven. It's those who come to the cross of Christ knowing that Christ has ruled over sin for them. And they trust in him. Believe in Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, you know what happens? The chains are broken off your life. The chains of sin and burden 
and deceit from sin and Satan, gone. Off your life. Free. You're totally free to know God and enjoy what it looks like to be obedient to Him. But Cain can't do that, can he? We see this in verse 8. Cain is unable to rule over sin. He says this. Cain spoke to Abel, in verse 8, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So, so what sin is, it's not only a lack of love for God. Sin is a lack of love for others. Now, this world's full of problems, isn't it? If we keep listening to our politicians, we're going to be overwhelmed by all the problems that they keep telling us this world has. Yes, there are problems. We need cleaner streets. Poverty is an issue. We need safer spaces for our children. But you know what the world needs most? Every person on planet Earth needs the power to love others the way that God loves us. That's what the world needs. When you look at the problems in your workplaces and with your family, the problems come from a heart that's unwilling to love others with the same grace and sacrifice and humility that God has shown us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, there, if there's anything, just think about all the things the church focuses on. If there's anything we as a church need to not assume but pay really, really close attention to, it's how the Holy Spirit is motivating us to love others like God has loved us in Christ. And there's a lot of ways to do that. We can offer grace to others. Just think about the hope of the gospel. We were reading this morning in 2 Timothy 3 about how the gospel is given to us because we're called to guard it. Because it's actually God in us that's guarding that good deposit of faith. But the reason why we're guarding it is because it's gone public. If you're believing in Jesus, there are so many beautiful, extravagant ways God is making that gospel public through our love. When we offer grace, when we offer hope, when we offer one another forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a powerful way of showing others the love of God. You know what forgiveness does? Forgiveness melts sin away like Olaf melts his son. I mean, it is a way for God to just melt down all of the shame and pride and all the conflict in relationships. Have you ever experienced conflict in a relationship? Have you ever had someone who's been unwilling to forgive you? Have you been unwilling to forgive others? Forgiveness is so powerful. But when we come to Jesus, we all our mess. Just think about when you come to faith and all of the baggage you bring with you. When you bring all that to Christ, you're forgiven of all of it. You're just forgiven. Freely forgiven. Received by God. Embraced for all of eternity. All of our consequences. Just all the judgment. God's going to judge us because of our sin. It's all gone. It's all forgiven. When we have faith. That same kind of attitude of accepting others, receiving them, forgiving them, is what God's calling us to do. Forgiveness is a way that we can take all of the hurt that's been caused by sin and turn it into healing. Turn it into reconciliation. It's an amazing way of loving others. And you know, I think about this a lot. I, I've counseled with, with some folks here in the church and in the community that are that are bound by grief and shame in relationships. If you really want to open up the floodgates of freedom in relationships, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door. When you really offer forgiveness, how do you do that? There's many ways to do that. One of the ways that we offer forgiveness to others is by not holding a debt against them. We release them of the debt. It's forgotten. It's gone. Think about the debt we owe God. God doesn't want us to come to him and pay back all the debt, right, in our own way, in our own strength. He just sees us Jesus who pays it for us. That's what forgiveness should be doing, releasing people of that guilt and that burden that they have towards us. You know, love loves a, a difficult thing sometimes because if we're all honest with ourselves, those kinds of relationships are really hard, aren't they? It's really difficult to do that. Sometimes love is not just the warm, hot chocolate feelings. Sometimes there's an edge to love. And part of that edge is being willing to, to forgive. But the other side of that edge, because it's double-edged, is repentance. You know a really good way to love others because of Jesus? is by repenting of sin. Whenever we've been saying things and doing things that are contrary to the gospel and hurtful, love is doing the opposite of that. And that's a beautiful thing. Instead of taking money, we give money. Instead of thinking the worst, we think the best. Instead of hurting the situation, we help the situation. Instead of 
you know, adding to the problem, we're adding to the solution. That's what repentance looks like. It looks like, like movement, change, love. This is not something that's unseen. It's something that's running down the street. It's practical, tangible. You can see it. It's action. It's movement. What are you doing to show repentance in that relationship? You know, Jesus is so big about our love for one another in these ways that he actually says, we can't say we love God if we don't love our brother. Because if we do say that, then we're hypocritical and ultimately like Cain, who didn't love his brother, but killed him. And at the end of the day, that kind of person is not ruled by Christ. You know what Colossians 3.15 promises? This is what it says. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. Don't be ruled by sin. Don't be ruled by hate. Don't be ruled by a lack of repentance or a lack of forgiveness. Be ruled by Christ. What's the alternative of not doing that? If we're not ruled by Christ, what's going to happen to us? What will be cursed? And this is what happens in verse 11 with Cain. He ends up being cursed. He says this. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord this. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold. You have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. You want to know the evidence of someone who's not repentant? They're only consumed with themselves. They're, this is Cain right here. Cain has heard what the Lord has said. And compare how the Lord has talked to him like he's talked to Adam. So Adam, the ground was cursed also because of Adam. Well, now, not only is the ground going to be cursed because of Cain, we've got some escalation here. Now, Cain is cursed. Cain is marked. Cain is not going to find rest. Cain's never going to have any peace. He's not going to be ruled by that. At the end of the day, Cain is just going to be someone who, who just takes and takes and takes and never gives. It's like a gumball machine. Keep putting in those quarters, but it never gives you the gumball. It's like the gumball machine you never produce. Somebody's talked to those folks. Get that thing fixed up. People who are not repentant are constantly only thinking about their own welfare. They're constantly trying to preserve themselves. The Lord, they're going to kill me, Lord. Cain, do you hear God saying to him? Change. Repent. Love me. He can't do that. There is a self-gratification here that is just a natural impulse in all of us that Cain is indulging. I mean, there are, in our situation, how we respond to, to the effects of sin says everything about our repentance. When we were responding to situations, and a lot of them are outside of our control, when we respond to them in ways that our first impulse is to constantly preserving our time and our money and our welfare and how it affects us. It may be, not, not all the time, but if, but if we're constantly doing that, right? If, we, if we're constantly taking offense, if we're constantly only thinking about the first thing that pops into our mind about us, then it may mean we have some deep-rooted pride. And that pride has got to be brought out. When you bring that to the surface, into the light of God's grace, that grace is like heat. It burns it up, and it replaces the pride with a humility that's willing to sacrifice anything to love others. That's what Christ shows us in the gospel. Every day you can treat God's grace like a Christmas toy that you get, and you enjoy it for just a little while, then it gets put in the closet and eventually forgotten and buried with all the other toys. Or you can treat God's grace like a rare, precious jewel, and you take care of it, and every morning when you get up, you put it on because it reminds you of what God has done to show you His love. <coughs> Which is it in your life? People are either marked by Cain, where they see God's grace as rubbish, garbage, or they're marked by God's grace, where they cherish God's word revealed in Jesus. 
and they submit to it. They're concerned about the welfare of others around them because they know where their destiny lies, the lies of God. They're content with that. One either dwells in the presence of the Lord or one dwells in the wilderness where Cain is about to go. You know what's going to happen one day? Is one day we're all going to see Jesus face to face. And on that day, we'll receive the reward for all the grace that God has poured into our lives if we're believing in Him. And you know who the last person will be that we'll be thinking of on that day? Us. We won't be thinking of ourselves at all. In fact, we'll be thinking of ourselves the least we ever have when we're standing in the presence of the King. We'll only be thinking about Him. Life is all about Jesus. To the world, that sounds so crazy, doesn't it? To us, it should sound normal. So let's start living like that's the new normal now. So we're not like Cain who was driven away. It said he was driven away from the presence of the Lord. Cursed. We don't want to be like that. We want to be marked by grace. So how do we apply this? If we're not going to be like Cain, who does not have faith and cannot love God and cannot repent, how are we going to change? i got a couple ways for us that we can apply what it means to not be like Cain. Here's the first one. Live at peace with others. That's difficult, isn't it? Living at peace with others. You've heard that phrase, it takes two to tango, right? I've never tried tango personally. Maybe you have. But I do know this, whenever you try to dance, it takes two to make it work well. The same is true with us in relationships. It's really hard to be reconciled when only one side of the relationship is giving in to grace and the other side's only giving in to themselves, preserving themselves. Whatever side you end up landing on, let's be like Jesus. Let's trust in Him. There's a reason why Paul says, he says this in Romans 12, 8, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with others. Because you can't control the other person. But in a clear conscience, you can be trusting in what God's calling you to do, to be reconciled in relationships. That's how we become people who are blessed by grace. Do you want our congregation to be blessed more by God's grace? Let's model how to be reconciled in relationships by living at peace with one another. Let's not be con content even if the reconciliation works out or not. Let's be content with grace. You know, I was reading this week in Daniel about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace because they're not going to submit to Nebuchadnezzar and bow down to the golden idol. And they say this. They say, the Lord will deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, do you hear what they're saying? Can you hear the faith in what they're saying? Even if he doesn't do that, we're not going to bow down to your idol. That's faith. That's being content. That's living at peace so far as it depends on you. It's in God's hands. Live at peace with others, and people will see you marked by God's grace. Number two, enjoy the Lord's instruction. Don't just hear it. We hear it every week. Don't enjoy it. Love it. Crave it. Do you crave God's word? Do you crave how to be a better parent, how to be a better grandparent, how to not waste your retirement, how to love others in the school system as well, how to share the gospel? You, God's word is teaching us all this. Do we crave it? How to be a healthy congregation with healthy policies, how to be organized well. Do you crave it? Do you crave God's word? Enjoy God's word. I got a skateboard once when I was a kid. Probably the worst thing my parents ever did, but that's okay. I enjoyed it. Whenever I would ride it, I, would, I, I rode, took it to my grandparents' house, and, and one day I was riding it, and my uncle was trying to tell me how the trucks work on the bottom. If I would just loosen the trucks up, then it would help me steer it a little bit better from left to right, so then I would enjoy it more. I wouldn't listen. No, 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 I got this. I can do this. So one day he just took the skateboard without me knowing, which like any good uncle would do, and he adjusted it. Some of you have done this. I know you have. And he adjusted the trucks anyway, and whenever I plopped on that thing, I did enjoy it more. It was a better experience, and it was probably a little bit safer, too. But I would have enjoyed it a lot faster if I would have just enjoyed his instruction. Not just, I heard what he was saying, but I didn't want it. Want what God is saying for you. And you will be blessed. Your enthusiasm for the purpose God has for you will be so much, that, that learning curve will be so much steeper to be encouraged about how to fulfill God's plan for your life. Enjoy instruction from the Lord.
Lord. And that does happen through reading the Bible. It really does. You know how else that happens, though, sometimes? It happens through God explaining the Bible to us from relationships we have with others. This is why it's so critical for us to connect. We're all about connection here. Because if we're connected as one body in Christ, the Lord uses those relationships to speak truth into our lives. When people are trying to speak truth into your life that's consistent with God's Word, do you enjoy that? Do you receive that? I really think that's one way we can grow as a congregation to move beyond just the superficial, but to the spiritual, elemental aspects of how we're called to relate to each other and relate to God together, not just in isolation. Enjoy receiving that. Be humble and receive the Lord's instruction through others. If we're really being honest with someone that we're trying to give instruction to, the other side of that is we'll be people who enjoy giving instruction. I think we would all enjoy if I take better care of our teeth. It was a more enjoyable experience going to the dentist. But it's unpleasant. We don't want to be unpleasant, do we? We want to be welcoming and hospitable to people whenever we're in these kind of relationships. When we're giving instruction, it's not like Thor's hammer coming down with lightning. But it's like a, a healing balm, an encouraging word. Even if it is a strong exhortation, that exhortation is, is given humbly and clearly and, and, and with long suffering. That's what we're called to as a church, those kinds of relationships. What's the Lord's will for your life? How is the Lord making you into a person who's not like Cain, but a person who every day is looking more like Jesus when your heart is willing to love Him and submit to His instructions? Let's pray again and ask the Lord to produce this in us. Lord Jesus, we need you to be producing in us hearts that are genuinely offering our lives as a pleasing sacrifice to you that's accepted by you because our hearts are believing in your gospel. Make us that kind of people. Help us help each other become those kinds of people so that we see evidences of your grace marking our lives more and more with all of its manifestations. Only you can do this we pray that you would, for your name's sake, Lord. Amen.